Okay, everyone, let's turn in our Bibles to the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke today. I'll be reading from verse 1 all the way down to verse 13. Subheading my Bible is the model prayer. Let's read together. Well, I'll read, you listen, follow along in your own Bibles. Now it came to pass as he, that is Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he, that is Jesus, said to them, When you pray, say, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at night, at midnight, and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are now with me in bed. I cannot arise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? Amen. We're looking now at the, the teachings of Jesus. This really is debatable whether it's in the chronological order of events happening in the life of Jesus. Um, there, there's a, a jump has happened here between 10 and 11. Uh, they're covered in John 9, I think, all the way up to maybe halfway, three quarters of the way through chapter 10. The, the events in between chapter 10 and chapter 11 are here. And so Jesus is now on his, we would say, the wind down. He's heading to Jerusalem. The cross is getting ever so close. It's coming closer and closer. Jesus is spending a lot of intimate time with his disciples. He is teaching. He is pouring himself into them. He is preparing them for the trial of the, the, the crucifixion and all the events surrounding it. And he's preparing them for ministry after the resurrection, after that he's taken up, and they must continue without him. And therefore, Jesus is unloading on them all that it is. Though he can in the short time that's with them. Now, at this point, it says here in verse 1, It came to pass that he was praying in a certain place, and when he had ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. This is not the first time that they have asked him this. Now, the, the Lord's Prayer, as it's commonly called, we, we would call it the model prayer, or the Lord's model prayer. Jesus had actually taught them this, at the beginning of his ministry, do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, 
that great manifesto, as, as Lloyd-Jones calls it in his two wonderful books on the Lord, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, that Christian manifesto, the Master's manifesto to his people, how the Christian life is to be lived. Well, way back at the beginning of his teaching, way back at the beginning of his ministry, when he was teaching on prayer, he taught them this. So now at the end of his time, after the three years, he's almost to the three and a half year mark, somewhere around there, the disciples, after witnessing Christ praying, now, we don't know if Christ was alone and the disciples came along or they were in a group, but Christ was off to the side praying privately or they were in a prayer meeting type situation and Christ had been praying. But for whatever aspect, Christ is praying, the disciples witness it and they're so taken aback by it, so moved by his prayers and his prayer life that once again they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. There was a closeness and a dependence, a dependency in Jesus that he always continually turned to the Father. He wasn't so strong in his nature that he could go two or three days without praying. But there was this continual reliance, this continual falling upon. One might say Jesus was a prayer addict. Couldn't go a day without praying. Couldn't go 15 minutes, one might say, without speaking to the Father. He knew that he was dependent upon the Lord, upon God the Father. The miracles that Christ had done, he had not done them in his own strength. The teaching and the authority that he had, it was not his own. But everything that he had, he had received from the Father. And he was very conscious of his lack and of his need. And the disciples witnessed this. It, it, it's very telling. The disciples don't ask Jesus, Lord, we, we've seen you teach and you're great. Help us to teach like you. They, they have heard, they have witnessed his grasp on the theology, him tearing apart the scribes and the theologians of his day. Tear strips off them. Leaves them like little children in the, in the playground crying. Christ is merciless in his teaching when it comes to the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees. And yet never once do we hear the disciples saying, Lord, help us to, to be a theologian like you. The thing that moved them, the thing that caused a, a, a godly ambition... A selfish desire in them was the, the prayer life of Christ. Beloved, the more and more you witness Christ, the more and more you know Him and know about Him, the more and more you should hunger to pray like He prayed. You tell me you're a, a, a theologian. You tell me that you are a man of the book. This book. And I then will ask you, are you a man of prayer? Are you a man frequented with that secret place? The closet. You know the old, old preachers used to talk about having camel knees? You know, big thick pads on their knees because they were always on their knees praying. The disciples desired to know from Jesus how to pray. And once again, he goes back to what he, he taught them in the beginning. He's simply reminding them. Now he doesn't say the same thing again. This prayer is not the same prayer that's prayed in in, uh, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. It's similar. 
certainly falls into the same categories, but it's not the same prayer. And therefore, we know that, that he was not teaching them a, a mindless kind of rosary bead prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, and just shooting that off like a machine gun, praying mindlessly. But rather, Christ is teaching them a model of how they are to pray, of how they are to communicate, of how they are to, to shape and mold their, their personal, private prayer life. If you desire to have a successful, dependent, humble prayer life, you must follow the, the way of the Master. You must follow his pattern. You must follow the instructions. Are you greater than Jesus? Ooh. Are you so confident in yourself that you think that you can survive this Christian life without having to pray and to be dependent upon the Father? Many of us say, we would never say, well, yes, I am better than Jesus, actually. None of us would be so coxy. What's that in English? Uh, Self-sure of ourselves that we would say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm actually better off than Jesus. But yet in our lives, in our actions, in our lifestyle... We may not say it with words, but in our actions, we proclaim it loudly. I don't need to be dependent. I am sufficient in this life. Well, I pray every now and again, two or three times a week, maybe. Five minutes here, ten minutes there. I just don't know what to pray for. I don't know, you know... I don't have anything in my life to pray about. You ever heard these excuses? I'm sure you, you've actually thought of these excuses. Uh, I live under such a cloud of guilt. I haven't prayed in such a long time. It would be hypocritical of me to pray now. Foolishness and a lie of the devil. Beloved, let us follow in the footsteps of our master. And if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heart cry from you should be this, Lord, help me to pray. Lord, teach me to pray. I want to be dependent. Not that you can be big and great in the standard of this world, you know? We can be the next Paul Washer if I just pray six times a day, you know? Fast. I can be like, no, it's not about that. It's that you might know the Father. That you might gain success over sin. That God's will and purpose and plans may be fulfilled in your life. And they, we, we talked about this in the past. I don't know if you remember that there is a potential Christian life. Now, there's grace in our life. And God is very gracious to us. And we are very much like little children. And the little children that we have, we show a lot of grace with them, don't we? When the little ones cry in the back, we all kind of go, that's what children do. You know, we love them. And when the little ones are messing around, you know, we're strict with them, but we still, we, we're gracious with them because they're children. But if an adult came into the service and began to behave like Levi, were the little one. We, we wouldn't be as gracious, would we? We would have to say, excuse me, can you, can you stop being disruptive? And if they didn't stop, we'd have to put them out, wouldn't we? We'd have to be... We'd have to behave in, in a way that, that would call them to responsibility. And God is very gracious with us. He treats us like little children. But oftentimes, we, we who are adult behave like infants in our faith. The, the patterns of the faith, uh, the prayer life, 
the Bible devotion, the, the walking with God daily and being his co-laborer in this life, his assistant in spiritual things, one whom he can entrust things to and people to. We sometimes fall very short there. We're very guilty at times when having been called to behave like men, adults, grown up, we oftentimes behave like adolescents, huffy children. Well, Christ would draw you out of that. Christ would have you heavenly dependent, heavily, heavenly dependent upon God the Father. He would have you praying successfully and continually. Not that your prayer life would be like this or like this under the ground. It is the enemy's desire that we would be a prayerless church. That you would be a prayerless people. The greatest victory the devil's ever scored over the church of God is that he has tricked us, conned us, romanced us, seduced us into being a prayerless people. We no longer cry out to our Heavenly Father. We kind of look down and look around. We'll do anything we can other than to come to the very one who is the author and finisher of our faith. The disciples were aware of this. And the disciple who spoke to Christ and asked him, teach us to pray. He must have felt that. Can you imagine what it's like seeing Jesus praying and seeing the intimacy between him and God the Father and hearing the pleading and the passion? Not just once, but it must have been the lifestyle, the pattern of Christ's lifestyle every day. What I like here is that, in my, and I know it doesn't say this, but in my mind I picture that they're in a group. You know, they're, 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 they're little camping group moving from one place to the other and they're in their little little huddle and Jesus goes off to the side not far but just off to the side and there and then privately yet publicly has his private time with the Lord speaks to God the Father intercedes for the disciples intercedes for the church cries out to God that his name might be glorified. That he might be lifted up. That he might show himself to be true. And the disciples are all sitting around. And there's Christ off the side. Can you imagine the pressure? Should we then pray? What should we do? I don't know. What should we say? I don't know. And yet there must have been such a holy and sacred hush fell upon the group. The Shekinah glory. Maybe not in its manifest reality, but God was there in that holy place. Jesus was meeting with the Father. And the disciples witnessed it and were moved by it. And once again asked Christ, teach us to pray as John's disciples had taught him to pray, taught them to pray. And Jesus once again reminds them. He simply says, do you not remember what I taught you before? And it's a refresher course. Nothing has changed. And this would be the pattern of the Lord's own praying. Though this is a prayer Christ is teaching, a model of praying that Christ is teaching his disciples, it is the model that he himself followed. Christ's own pattern of daily prayer is found here. How did Jesus pray? This is how Jesus prayed. How are you and I to pray? This is how you and I are to pray. Daily. Dependently. We're looking at it now. Jesus said, and when you pray... I love that. There is the expectation. Christian, if you're a believer, person here today, if you're a believer, 
Christ expects you to pray. There is the expectation that you will have communication with God the Father. That you will talk to Him and communicate to Him. That you will be dependent upon Him. My children are dependent upon me. Hard to believe and they don't believe it, but they are. The money that they receive, they get from me. The groceries in our house, they get from us. My wife buys them. I eat them. The electricity, the water, the house in which we live, the car in which we drive, the petrol, the game console and the games that they own. Everything is from us parents, from me. They are dependent. There's a lesson there. And as that is true in an earthly way, it is true in a spiritual way. We are dependent upon our Father. And like children, we don't always appreciate that everything we have and been given and are living in, all those benefits and blessings, they come from God the Father. And Jesus, right here in this prayer, he begins with the, the name, the title, Father. In my Bible, it says, Our Father. But really, he just says here, Father. Which is a break from the norm in the Jewish thinking. The Jews were okay in public prayer. They would pray, Our Father, meaning the Father of Israel. But they would never say in a personal prayer, My Father or Our Father. That was very too, too close. God wasn't up close. He was far away. But here Christ is saying that God is up close and personal with you. That you are a part of his family. That you are a dependent. When they used this name, this title, Father, it was, we don't have it in our culture. It's hard to explain. He was the one to whom everybody else was beholden. He was the one who decided and provided and cared for everybody, decided everybody's portion and lot. He was the one who came and gave clothes. He was the, the source of safety and protection and provision. It wasn't just a, a, a family relationship. He was the umbrella keeping them safe. He was the, the, the guardian, the final authority. That by calling him father, we recognize that we are his children and that we are his dependents and that we are physically dependent upon him, spiritually dependent upon him. He is the highest authority in your life and that you are dependent upon him. Like in our individualistic world today, we don't really think of ourselves as belonging to a family group with hierarchies and all those pyramids, father, and then goes on from there. In Ireland, we have that. My grandmother, my great-grandmother was the head of the family. She ruled with an iron rod. She was a tiny woman. And when she said no, everybody just, that was the end of the conversation. You know, when she said, this is what we're going to do as a family, it all happened. That woman had power over everybody's lives. None of the men would ever question her because she was such a wise woman and she was a dragon, <laughs> you know. But we call God Father. We are recognizing that we are dependent upon him, that he has authority in our lives, that he is the one who decides, leads, guides. One of the commentaries that I read this week is to get a concept of this, to, to understand it biblically, one must think of Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses was, Moses was as a father to Israel. Moses led the Israelites into the, the wilderness, into the wastes, across the sea. 
or through the sea, could we say. And it was Moses who was responsible for them before God. When we talk to God, we must understand that we are dependent upon him as children are dependent upon their parents. How much can your little one do for herself? Very little. I witnessed it today. We must understand that before God, we are but infants and we are dependent upon him. The babies need fed. Children apparently need fed. Even big ones like this. You need, they need fed several times a day. And that it's the parents' responsibility to make them food several times a day. Ridiculous. We must recognize that God is our Father. And he's our Father in heaven. The absolute Father. That we are his children and dependent upon him. His responsibility. That's a wonderful teaching, isn't it? And as, as his children, we are his responsibility. Now the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer here, is divided into two. People will say, well, it's divided into six, blah, blah, blah. But really, it's divided into two. The first half is heavenward. It's praying to God for God. The second half is praying to God about man, about human needs, about your personal need and responsibilities. Jesus says that we are to think of God as our Father. We are his dependents. He is responsible for us. Second part of this prayer then, he says, Hallowed be your name and mine. Sanctified, holy, set apart, separate. May you demonstrate your holiness in this earth. May your name in me, may your name. Now, my name is McCartan. These are the sons of Kyle McCartan. I am very conscious of how my name is used in the village. I don't want people to, I don't want my name, because I am first of my name in this nation. I don't want the, 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 the reputation of the McCartan family to be uh, near smooth side. What's that in English? Uh, pardon? Tarnished. You all knew that what I was saying. I know how to say it. Tarnished. I don't want people to, to use my name as, a, as a, some kind of bad thing. I care about the reputation of my family. I know it's hard to believe, but I do. In the same sense, when Christ is praying here, teaching his disciples, he's praying God is our Father, and that we must seek that His name should be treated with respect. It should be seen to be apart from this world. Not just another God in the crowd. Not just a, a weak and limp, limp and flimsy God. But He should be set apart from the, the nations of this world. That His children should be seen to be like their Father set apart in this world. When we begin to pray, we must always begin with God's honor, and God's reputation. We must intercede that God would be glorified upon this earth. Now, this is revolutionary because when we pray as human beings, our first thought always goes to who? Us. Lord, help me. Lord, bless me. Lord, I need this. I need that. Lord, help them. Help that. And we forget to put God first. We forget to come before him and to cry out, Oh God, may your name be seen to be glorified. May you be set apart from the nations. Lord, glorify your name amongst us. Jesus would have God put first. We must get back to that. We who are a biblical church. We seek to be a biblical church. Is that not so? We seek to reform our lives in accordance with the word. That the word might be made manifest in us and through us. That people might see him in all that we do. We take his worship serious. 
Do we take his prayer serious? Do we take our prayer lives, our act of worship to him in our prayers serious? And if so, are we doing it in his fashion? When you pray, Jesus said, let this be the, the fashion of your prayers. Let this be the model of your prayers. Put God first. Put the, the, the name of your father first. Pray that he would glorify himself. That he would demonstrate the reality of him in you and through you. The people might see that he is the true and real God and there is no other like him. Hallowed be your name. And then he says, your kingdom come. Here, when we pray this, we pray, Lord, I'm praying for this person. I'm praying for that person. But I'm not praying for you just because, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do or because I like you or because I want good things to happen for you. I pray for you that God's kingdom might come about in your life. That God might bring glory to his name by changing you. By maturing you. By developing you from being someone who's broken and useless in this world to being transformed to being a godly servant of God, self-disciplined and controlled, having the fruit of the Spirit abundantly seen in your life from being of no profit to being full of profit. Not a prophet as in one who is a, speaks the future, but one who, who has gains. Christ desires that the kingdom of God might come. And he's not praying that, that the people will get saved. and He's not praying that, that, that Christians would be happy. All those things are valid prayers. But he begins with God and God's honor, God's name, God's reputation and how he is seen in this world. How his church represents him. Beloved, let us pray then for the kingdom of God to come in our lives and in, in each other lives, in the life of our church, in the counties, the communities that we live in, that God's kingdom might be demonstrated. That he might move in power, bringing revival. Again, not for the sake of man, primarily. But that for his own name's sake. We're praying, Lord, you do this. Lord, remember. Remember your covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. That if he died and he bled and he gave us life for the sheep... That, Lord, you would redeem unto him a people zealous for good works. You would give him the reward of his suffering. Lord, remember what Christ died for. Lord, would you withhold from him? Oh, Father, would you withhold from Jesus? Remember him. Our prayers. We are to be dependent upon God the Father. Jesus was dependent. He didn't go two, three days without prayer. Daily, intimately, unashamedly, weekly, crying out to God for help. That God might glorify his own name. And then he prays that God's will, your will, Father, will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. That this day, Lord, as I'm moving in my life, as I'm doing what I'm doing, as, as things are happening, your will. Let me be assured and, and, and secure in that as I live my life and things happen, that you're in control. Now, God is always in control. This is us submitting to his will. It's us crying out to him that he might show himself to be sovereign in all things. In this, I'm thinking of the, of the Asher's Bakery case. Do you remember that? In Northern Ireland, uh, 
Pastor McCollum, who's coming next year, was part of what was going on there. And I told you that that court case, um, they lost the first court case, the court case. And we prayed and we sought the Lord, didn't we? Well, some of us did. Asking that God would grant them success in the next court case. When they went to the, the next higher court and they lost that one too. And everyone was down in their hearts. Oh God, we don't understand what's happening. It's such a great defeat. Terrible. The only way was to take it to the Supreme Court. And it was very unlikely that we were going to win. Very unlikely. And yet God did a great thing. And the case was overturned, thrown out. And now there is a precedent, a, a, a case to be made in the law. The law was somehow in some way changed to protect business owners from attacks like this. Though the first one failed and the second one failed. But yet God had a plan and a purpose. And though we were all praying, Lord, let them succeed in the first case they lost. Was God helpless? What, what, was God's arm too short in order that he could not save? No. They went to the second and more people prayed. People were fasting. Whole weeks of fasting were declared by many churches. They sought the Lord and yet they came out of the courtroom somewhat in despair, saddened, shocked dismayed once again they had failed looked like they were going to have to pay thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds in, in damages for this scam they appealed it again and took it to the supreme court and people again were praying this time lord we don't know what but lord your will be done and the third final time, victory. God did a great victory. And now, again, there has been a precedent made in the, in the law of the land protecting all Christian business owners. Christ or prayed, your will be done. We must pray in our lives, day and daily. Lord, may your will be done. Though I don't understand it. Though I don't see What's going to happen? Though, Lord, it looks like we're failing and we're losing. My God, I am secure in this. All things work together for the good of them who love him and are called according to his purposes. When you pray, ask him. Seek, intercede that God might glorify his own name. That his will and his purpose in your life would be fulfilled. Though you may not see it. When you pray for your wife, your child, your children. You pray for your future. You pray for your present. Lord, I don't understand where I am right now. Lord, sometimes it feels as dark inside as it is outside. But I pray your will be done. I am confident in you, God, that you will make these things work out for your good. Christ wants his disciples to pray properly. And that begins with praying to God about God. That his name might be lifted up. That his plans and purposes might be fulfilled in your life, in our lives, in the lives of the congregation, in the lives of the community, and in the country. We're all too eager to begin with ourselves like little babies. We just want what we want. We want it now. But for the mature in Christ, it begins with his name and his glory. That our father might be seen to be a righteous father. A good father. One who provides. One who protects. One who guides. One who gives liberally to his children. Demonstrating the reality of Christ. The reality of sins forgiven. And of new birth. The newness of the new life. 
We are commanded to begin with God, to seek God's glory. Are you seeking God's glory? Are you struggling and fighting and and praying and, and, and clinging on? Lord, be glorified this day. Be glorified this day in me and in my marriage, in my relationships, in my friendships. Lord, as I am a a child to my parents, Lord, be glorified in that. As you're walking down the street, as you're in Prisma or some supermarket, wherever you may be, in your workplace, and God opens up a door. Someone says, look, I, I... I don't know why, I just think I should share this with you. I've been having really dark thoughts. I don't want you to tell anyone, but I've been considering having, committing suicide. He said, God, people don't say that. I've had people say that to me. I've had people whom I've worked with tell me that they went out into the barn, put ropes around their necks, sat on a beam, and were going to jump off. They were this close to committing suicide, leaving their wife and their children. They had had enough. You know what stopped them? A little sparrow landed on, on, the, on the beam next to him. And it cheeped. Cheep, cheep. He said, so close I could have reached out and touched it. And I remembered a Bible verse. A Bible verse was like a voice spoke in my head. You're worth many, more than many sparrows. He said it was from, from Sunday school. When I was a little boy, I remember a verse from Sunday school. You're worth more than many sparrows. He says, I couldn't tell you where that was from. I've never read the Bible in my life. But I remember that Bible verse. And he said, something changed inside me. I took the rope off my neck, untied it, coiled it up, put it in a box, locked the box, went back into the house and opened my Bible. The wedding Bible. You know, in Lutheran church, you get a Bible when you get married. He says, I opened it up. Couldn't understand a word of it. <laughs> a few days later, he has a burning desire to talk to someone about God. He needs to talk to someone about God. And he says, the only person I knew that ever talked about, about God in any shape, form, or fashion that made sense, Kyle, was yourself. And I'm here to talk to you about God. They phoned us, didn't they, about 7 o'clock in the morning and came to our house on a Sunday before church. I need to know about God. Tell me. As you are walking with the Lord, he opens doors. People are activated and they will turn to you and they will share with you the the deepest, most intimate secrets of their life because God in you is calling out to them. And all you have to do is say the words and point to the Savior. You don't have to have qualifications in counseling. You don't have to have a a master's in knowing what to say or how to say it. Stumble, bumble, fumble. You don't have to be good. You know the Apostle Paul when he went to to um, Corinth? He went there with with shaking and tears and much fear. Phobos, terrified. And yet the Lord still used him and he planted a church there. Beloveds, are you praying that God would glorify himself through you, that he would use you, that you would be able to be dependent upon him, that his name would be glorified? Not for your sake and not for my sake, not for the sake of this church, but for Christ's sake, for God the Father's sake, for he who rescued you from eternal damnation, that he might demonstrate himself to be faithful. And then we turn to the second part of this prayer, which is then God on behalf of man. And he says, he begins with, give us day by day our daily bread or our daily portion. Now, I I, I like this because it, it reminds us of the limitation of prayer. Prayer is limited. Day by day. How much? How long? He didn't say, Lord, give me enough bread to last the rest of the week, to see me through the rest of the year. He didn't pray, Lord, help me that I will be full and never need to be fed again. Lord, the need that I have for this day. Now, of course, I'm talking spiritual needs. 
but still there is a, the, the, the physical need, Lord, the physical needs that I have for this day. Please help me. Make, make do. We cannot pray for tomorrow's need. We cannot pray for tomorrow's wants and worries. We must pray for the things that we face today. We are limited. Christ has limited us. All too often, our mind jumps to things that are far in the future, that have no real context on what's happening today. Sometimes our biggest fears are things that, that never happen. And we can't see the, the, the hardship and the difficulty and the, the real need that we have right now. Because we're so focused on something that may happen at some time. Christ wants you to live in the now. Again, one of the commentaries that I was reading talked about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness and the manna that was given to them. And they received just enough for that day, except on the day before the Sabbath. And that manna, that, that gift of God to them at that point was a daily gift. And friends, you and I have daily needs. Every morning his mercies are new, it says in the book. And therefore you and I, beloved, have a daily need for prayer. We have a daily need to take the lives of our children, of our wives, of our friends, our family, our mothers, our fathers, our workmates, the, our own issues in our own life, the hardships, the darknesses, the, the struggles, the emotional problems, the difficult relationships that we go through and, and face that the Lord loves and delights putting us in. We must take them before him. And you say, well, can I pray at one time and nothing ever happened? Pray again and again and again until something does happen. It may not be the thing you want to happen, but something will happen. Day and daily. Seeking the Lord. Crying out to him that he will give you enough for that day. Your spiritual nourishment. You cannot live today on what you ate yesterday. You kind of survive on last week's meals. You cannot eat rotten food from a year ago. Spiritually speaking, you cannot survive on the nourishment God gave you last Sunday or last Tuesday or when you listen to a sermon or something, something, something. A snack, spiritual snack. You must be nourished. You must receive your portion. And the idea here is that the father in the family in the olden days used to give portions to his children. Our daily portion. That, that, that which is assigned to me this day. We each have what is an assignment. Uh, a portion that has been given to us. God has set aside a portion for you for this day. Cry out unto the Father that he might liberally deliver it to you. Oftentimes it's there, you just don't access it. Oftentimes you're so busy trying to do your own thing that you miss what God has provided. It's like trying to make a, a, a peanut butter and jam sandwich when there's a full four-course meal waiting for you. And you're saying, Lord, help me. And God's, the, the nourishment and the provision is all waiting for you. If only you would trust and obey. If only you would receive it. If only you would walk in the fullness. If only you would be at peace and trust him. There is a condition there, isn't there? Today's bread. Today's portion. In the next part, 
verse 4, he says, And forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. This isn't in a salvation type way. This is, of course, a lesson to the saved. It's praying to the people of God, uh, for the people of God. It's not asking God to save you, but if you, God cannot save you unless you forgive everybody in your life. This is not that. This is, as we live our lives and as believers, we, we do things that are not in his will. We don't pray. We say sharp things. We, we are not gracious in our relationships with our, with our people around us. We, we have sins that we, we fight with that still seek to conquer us. We doubt, we fear, we're full of pride. There are parts of us that are unreformed as of yet. And sin, in some sense, crouches at the door seeking to take us. In order that we might be fully forgiven, live in the fullness and the freedom, the blessing of God, that we might have unbroken relationship with Him in the fullest and freest sense. I'm not saying that if we sin, God stops being our Father. It's nothing like that. But here we do see that there is a condition that we are required by God to demonstrate the same grace that He shows us. We must show to those who sin or Act against us. The word here is indebted. Those who owe us something or something. We are required by God to be as gracious to others as he is to us. That is such a challenge. Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. As you are gracious to me, help me to be as gracious to others. Help me to be as forgiving. Help me to put aside, not just to, to forgive, but Lord, also to forget. To think upon no more. Because, you know, we can say, well, I forgive you. But then the, the little shadow, you know, the, the little voice. Ah, but I remember what he did last time. There is to be none of that in us. We are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We are required to be a forgiving people. To be a people demonstrating His goodness. So when we're praying, we pray, Lord, forgive me. I don't know if that means you have to confess your sin to God. The Father, Lord, today, you know, I thought ungodly thoughts, whatever. I'm sure the Holy Spirit will convict you and lead you and open up your mind. And if there's problems in you, He will demonstrate very clearly to you the difficulty it may mean that you have to go to your brother or a sister and say listen i'm sorry i i have held grudge grudges against you i have acted in an ungodly way please forgive me i remember once i had to go the, i was convicted in my spirit of speaking badly against another pastor i was a young man in my early 20s and I had to go then to that pastor's house, knock on the door, open the door, and say, Sir, forgive me, I have spoken bad about you, and I have been convicted in my spirit. It was not right. I am sorry. And he's like, Okay, you're forgiven. And I was like, Thank you, sir. And I walked away, and he was like, Okay. Well, that was weird. But sometimes the Holy Spirit will require of you to make right to humble yourself in order that he might be glorified. He then moves on in part B of verse 4. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The word temptation here is the standard word for temptation. It can mean trial. Right? This doesn't mean that God leads us into temptation because it tells us in the book of James that God cannot tempt nor can be tempted by evil. He is not the author of sin. But he can protect us and guard us and guide us and provide us an avenue from sin. We think of when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And he took refuge in the word of God. 
He hid himself and he defeated Satan by clinging to the truth of Scripture. When you and I are facing situations in our lives, you know, the temptation to tell a lie or to speak an untruth, which is a lie but can be a different kind of lie. Or to say nothing when you should say something. When we have a haughty spirit, a prideful spirit, we judge our brothers and sisters and we speak negatively about them. Gossip and slander. We pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us before those things come out of our mouths. That the light comes on in our head. That we woo that God would put a guard upon our mouths. A hand upon our heart. That the scriptures would, would bounce to our remembrance. Remember when that gentleman I told you about was going to hang himself? And the little bird landed beside him and that verse popped into his mind? You're worth more than many sparrows. That was God. That was God speaking to that man, protecting him and his children, his wife. That God would protect us from temptation. And we take it for granted, don't we? Just every day that God's watching out for us. We do, and, and he is. But there, there should be a part of our life, Jesus demonstrates it in this prayer, where we actively submit to God's authority in our life where we actively ask him to glorify his name by protecting us from sin from the very temptation of doing wrong you must ask God to help you on a daily instance not every now and again maybe when you remember but you need God's help every day. You must submit to God's help every day. That potential Christian life, it's not a myth. It's not pie in the sky. It's not Bigfoot in the forest. It's out there. It's a reality. It's for those who want it and will take it. Will walk in his ways and keep his requirements. We must ask him to protect us. To lead us not into temptation. That we won't follow the path that leads us to sin. That dishonors his name. That shames you, your wife, your children, your family, your church. Think of the minister, the Christian minister in America who earlier this year got caught for the second time in adultery. Lost his Ministry lost his worldwide influence, lost his family. Him and his wife are still trying to work it out, but that's a hard one right there. The shame that they must carry, he must carry, that his wife and his children must carry for the rest of their life. Any of us. can fall and falter to sin. Married, was it, 40 years? Protect us, O oh Lord. Protect me from, from the, the sin of the eyes, the sin of the, the flesh, Lord, the boasting of what a man has and does, or the pride of life, in one translation. Protect me, God, for I am not strong, and there are things that could tempt me to do ungodly things. Please, God, protect me. You need the protection of God. We need the protection of God. And Jesus says that you must pray it. It must be part of the model of your prayer. Seeking protection for yourself, for your family, for your friends, for your church, for your community. The last part of this prayer, of course, is deliver us. From the evil one. Do you know that the enemy, the devil, he's still out there? His forces are still active out there. They are still blinding the eyes of the ungodly. 
they are still wandering. The Bible says that the devil wanders around like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. He is active against churches like ours. Do you think he's out there torturing the Lutheran church? Do you think he is? I don't think he is. He may rule many parts of the Lutheran church with their leaning towards homosexuality and other things, denying the gospel, adding to it. But he's not, in any way, shape, or form, seeking to devour them. Little churches like ours, clinging to the truth, proclaiming. We are high on his priority. I think Jim Eliff, when he came to us, and he said, Mikhail, don't despise the, the day of small things. Don't think that, that just because you're a tiny little pinprick of a, of a church on a great map that you're unimportant. For you don't know what God is doing here in this little acorn of a church. And also don't disregard the efforts of Satan against you. And he was right, oh my goodness, in our lives with the court cases and everything else that we've gone through. We are to seek God's protection on a daily basis from the efforts of the enemy. The more God entrusts you, the more that you begin to be used by God, and God elevates you, now not in a worldly way, but in a, in a, in a Christ way, it's like painting a big bullseye on your back and all of a sudden Satan desires you. He desires to make you fall. And we are reminded of Job, aren't we? And all the trials and hardships that Joel had to go through. Not Joel, Job, excuse me, Joel. All the hardships and trials that Job had to face and go through. Satan desired him, didn't he? You and I, brothers and sisters, let us not take it for granted simply because we are the seed, the elect, the chosen of God. That in some way that puts us apart from any kind of danger or threat. That the enemy doesn't exist. I can't remember who it was. And somebody said the greatest deception the devil ever did was having, getting people to believe that he didn't exist. And we, we as believers, especially as we as reformed believers, because we're very distant from the devil, you know, we're great in our Christology, we're great in our, our, our I was going to say eschatology, ecclesiology and all these other things. But when it comes to, to the doctrine of Satan, well, we believe in an actual devil, we believe that he's out there, we believe that he's active, but in our lives, nah, yeah, you know. Beloveds, let us not be naive. Let us not be foolish. Let us not be slow. Christ ends this prayer, this teaching on prayer, by having his disciples cry out to God for protection against the actions, against the intentions of the enemy, of the evil one. That is Satan, the devil, the destroyer, Apollyon, the great dragon. We must ask God for protection from our own li in our own lives, over our families, over our church, over our communities. Seek God. Don't think that you're able to stand against him by yourself. Have you ever seen those videos on YouTube when animals attack? You ever seen those? You know, they had these great ones of people in China jumping into lion dens and stuff, you know, thinking that they'll, I have a way with animals. They'll love me. Maybe Chinese man goes over to stroke the lion's head, and the lion's like, are you mad? And the lion is like, and then all of a sudden, the, lion, the lioness, not a male lion, a lioness, leaps on the little Chinese man, and then it goes all bl blurry because they don't want you to see the Chinese man get eaten by the lion. And then all the other lions jump on top of him. Or the lady in China who got out of her car to take a picture of the tiger. You ever see that one? 
they're in a safari park, they're driving through the lion, or uh, the tiger enclosure, and she couldn't get close enough on her camera. She wanted a close up of the lion's face, a tiger's face. She couldn't get one, so she opens the car door, gets out, and she walks over to the tiger to take a picture. And then, of course, next thing you see from the security camera up on the wall is her legs being pulled off into the bushes. Her husband gets out of the car to try and rescue her, but then the, the rest of the tigers are all coming, so he gets back in the car. And all they find of her is her shoes. Let us not be naive. Let us not be like these foolish people who do not believe in an actual devil who has evil intent to you, to me, to our community, to the purpose and the kingdom of Christ. He seeks to destroy Christ's kingdom and he will try and do that and therefore you and I must seek protection. The reason why I told you the story about the lions and the tigers and not the bears, oh my, was that these people thought that they and themselves were able enough to stand against a lion or a tiger. They thought that just because they're human and nobody ever gets eaten by tigers, we you talking about? And they got out and they took it for granted that they were safe and <laughs> lion or tiger took them and at them. In the spiritual realm, you and I often behave like those little Chinese tourists jumping into lion's den, getting out of cars, and trying to take pictures of tigers. We naively think that the devil is now a putty cat. He's being declawed and defanged. He's no longer dangerous. He has no authority or power in this earth. He is, in some way, in some sense, being bound. But yet Christ taught his disciples that they were to seek protection in this life from the evil one and all of his intentions. Beloved, let us not be naive. Let us, in our prayer life, begin to pray biblically, putting God first, seeking that his kingdom, his name, his will might be established, that he might lift himself up, that he might visit us in power. That what he does, he does not for our sake, but for the sake of Christ, for his own name's sake. And then, beloved, let us begin to pray for ourselves, remembering the limitations of prayer. That your prayer life is for today and today only, because tomorrow doesn't exist and yesterday is gone. And all you have is today. Live in the now. Christ wants his disciples to live in the now. Not fearful for the future. Not full of regret for the past. To be present in the today. Seeking God's provision for the now. That we might demonstrate his graciousness. His forgiving spirit. That we might be as he is to us, to others. Understanding that if we are negative and bitter and closed in our spirit and hold grudges, that that somehow in some way blocks our relationship with God. Does the Bible not say that God opposes the pride but gives grace to the humble? Do you think that's only to unbelievers? That's to you and to me, brother and sister. If you are proud, full of pride and avarice, that limits your relationship with God. God puts you on pause, time out. Let us be as Christ. We must seek God's help in order that we might be as forgiving as he is. Let's pray that we won't fall into temptation. You're not strong enough to resist temptation by yourself. You're not strong enough to overcome sin by yourself. It crouches at the door, waiting to take you. And it is only by a move of God's Spirit in your life that you will be delivered from it. That God, by His Word, might fortify your inner man or woman, person. That you might be strengthened in your faith. That you might see and know the dangers before you face them. That He might give you biblical foresight. That when your tongue slips, that terrible evil, that wicked 
deadly poison, the tongue begins to say something negative, untrue. That the Holy Spirit might convict you to your heart. That you might say, Lord, forgive me. That you might turn from temptation. And then lastly, that you might receive protection from that great cat, that evil one, that destroyer, that beast who seeks your destruction. That you might be protected in your mind. You might not believe his lies, his half-truths. We know his tactics, don't we? We know from the beginning. Remember he spoke to Eve. Did God say? It wasn't an outright denial. It was a question and a suggestion. A deflection. That God might protect us in our minds. That we might not take our eyes from our Savior. That we might not forget our mission. That we might preserve and protect the unity of the believers. He is a murderer, a destroyer, a thief. That God might protect us. You cannot stand against him by yourself. You have no hope, no chance. Beloved, if we were to put you in the lion's den, you'd be, you'd be dinner. If you were to try to get out of your car and take pictures of a tiger, you'd be dinner. Do you think that you would be able to stand against a creature? I don't know how old the devil would be. Thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years old. Who's seen everything, knows everything, is wiser than you and I will ever be. Him and his forces. There is only one devil, I know that. He's not in your life and my life at the same time. But he is a destroyer. And you need, his, you need the, the help of Christ, the help of God by his spirit in your life, day and daily, a dependence upon the Father for protection that he might draw his arms around you. Beloved, begin to pray biblically. Begin to seek him. Begin to be dependent. In those days when you say, Lord, I can't be bothered today, fall down on your face and begin to pray. You cannot pray as you want, pray as you can. Oh God, be glorified in my life. And I help me. You say, Lord, help me. Give me strength to pray. And beloveds, he will give you strength to pray. The words will come tumbling out of your mouth. And you, the, the Spirit of God will pray in you and through you. Amen. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you and give you praise and honor. We thank you for the gift of life that we have received through faith in Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we seek to honor you, that you would help us. Lord, we, like your disciple from long ago, ask, O oh God, that you would help us to pray. Teach us to pray. Lord, we, we look at that model. We look, Father, at, at that teaching that Christ gave his disciples then and his disciples now. And Lord, we ask that you would imprint it upon our minds, that we might meditate upon it, we might chew over it. Lord, we might incorporate it into our very heart, the flesh of our being, that we might live it, that it might take precedent in our, in our, in our daily routines, that we might fight for it and win it. Lord, we are weak people. We belong to a generation that is individualistic and very anti-God. And our habits are bad habits, Lord. Oh, please, Lord, help us. Help us to be like Christ. Help us to be dependent upon you, Father. Help us to, to see our need of you in our lives. Lord, we so often are like Sodom of old. Lord, our great sin is that we have too much bread. We have too little need. Oh, God, be gracious to us. Glorify yourself among us. Glorify yourself in our lives and through our lives and demonstrate the reality of who you are. Lord, we, pre we do pray these things for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.